Okay, well, good afternoon again, and thank you for joining us for this month's Charging Infrastructure webinar series. My name is Chris Bast. I'm the Director of EV Infrastructure Investments for the Electrification Coalition, and I am pleased to be the MC for this afternoon's event, where we are focused on technology, power, and station design for EV charging stations. It's a big topic, admittedly, and I'm looking forward to, to digging into it uh, with our panelists and all of you. Before we get going, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes for you from the EC. Um, our next charging infrastructure webinar will be on Thursday, July 21st. Uh, more information on that is to come. However, I am excited to announce to you that that webinar will focus on the newly released draft minimum standards and requirements for charging stations funded through the National EV Infrastructure Funding Program, otherwise known as NEVI. We'll have a panel of experts to react to the draft standards and some best practices and tips for how to provide comments during the federal government's 60-day comment period. Next, uh, note that we are hiring at the Electrification Coalition. We have several jobs open um, and uh, many more probably in the months ahead. So continue to check out our website for the latest job postings, help us spread the word far and wide. We're posting on social media, check out LinkedIn and uh, looking forward to growing our team. So technology, power and station design, as I said, a big topic, we could go in uh, seven and a half billion different directions with this topic. And today we're gonna hear from charging infrastructure providers, technology providers, uh, and some uh, academic experts on the latest technology and implementation and best practices in this space. So we'll dig into how technology can help solve some of the typical power management challenges for charging stations and how technology can help ensure the stations we install today will continue to support mass adoption of EVs for many years to come. So uh, enough from me and time to introduce our panel. I'll introduce everybody one at a time. We've got three speakers for you. Uh, they'll each have a presentation about 10 minutes and then we'll go into some Q&A uh, with some members of our team and then bringing in some audience Q&A. So um, get your questions ready, uh, put them into the, the Q&A box that you see on your screen and we will um, be facilitating that for you at the end of the webinar. We will start uh, with Dr. Deepak Devan, who is director of the Center for Distributed Energy at Georgia Tech. He is an expert in the areas of power electronics, smart grids, and distributed control of power systems. He works closely with utilities, industry, and is actively involved in research, teaching, entrepreneurship, and starting new ventures. He has 40 years of academic and industrial experience, 65 issued and pending patents, and over 400 refereed publications. He led the team at Georgia Tech that invented grid block energy router technology, which makes plug and play microgrids possible and dramatically reduces the cost of DC fast charging. He's raised over $160 million in venture funding and founded or seeded several ventures, including soft switching technologies, Innovolt, Baron Tech, and Smart Wires. He's an elected member of the US National Academy of Engineering, a member of the National Academy's Board on Energy and Environmental Systems, a fellow of the IEEE, past president of the IEEE Power Electronic Society, and is recipient of the IEEE William Newell Field Medal. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Devon, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the lead-in. Uh, and, uh, you know, good afternoon to everybody. I, you know, happy to lead off this uh, very interesting discussion on uh, electric vehicle charging stations uh, and uh, some of the issues that uh, are around it. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of lead off, you know, first with kind of talking about why this thing is so uh, important, but also really to understand where some of the gotchas are that uh, I think we're not paying as much attention to as, as we should. Um, so I'm, I'm with the Center for Distributed, uh, you know, Energy. Uh, at, uh, at Georgia Tech, where we are kind of working uh, holistically on a range of, uh, you know, interconnected issues associated with the energy transition uh, that uh, we, are, we are all going through. Um, we, we look at issues at a fundamental level as BFIT's an academic institution, but uh, as Chris mentioned, you know, uh, uh, a lot of experience we're trying to take these technologies actually to market uh, and to make an impact. So this is kind of uh, our, our special uh, thing that we do uh, and uh, happy to kind of, uh, you know, talk, uh, talk about it. So, you know, let's, let's kind of start at the fundamental level where we think about, you know, the energy disruption that is actually underway right now. Uh, it's across pretty much every field. I mean, you know, uh, solar, uh, energy storage, transportation, electrification, you know, all these things are growing at, uh, at a pace that was unimaginable just, you know, five years ago. So why is, why is this disruption occurring? 
I think you boil it down to two things. You know, one is you know the fact that the prices of these technologies uh, continue to go down a very steep and sustained learning curve. Uh, PV solar is at 23% for 50, 50 plus years, and batteries are at 26% uh, uh, you know, learning curve uh, with, uh, with prices that are really starting to become uh, very, very uh, interesting at this point in time. All these technologies actually intersect with the grid in some way uh, because they exchange energy with the grid. And these are all growing at a very phenomenal pace, uh, but they are all outside the control of the utilities, you know, who are supposed to be supplying this. And that I think creates an opportunity for some, uh, some very interesting uh, issues and challenges. Let's look at, uh, at transportation electrification, uh, you know, for, uh, for a second. Uh, as I said, you know, we're growing very fast, 60% year over year. Uh, a mid estimate of uh, how many EVs will be on the road is about 125 million uh, by 2040. Uh, we see that uh, this is not really driven by our, our uh, you know, wonderful attraction for climate change, but, but really because it's a lower cost of manufacturing and ownership for, uh, for, for the manufacturers uh, and eventually for, uh, for owners uh, as well. Uh, we see that you know, the question of equitable access, you know, needs to be addressed, uh, and that includes charging infrastructure uh, that will be available, uh, you know, to, uh, to everybody. And this is, this is really a fundamental uh, issue. We see that all of this is occurring and uh, is applying to a grid that is already very uh, stressed, and we'll see why this is stressed, uh, and we'll see, you know, that uh, this creates uh, opportunities for, for, uh, uh, for significant problems that uh, we have. If we don't manage to get proper infrastructure in place for charging, you know, then it will in invariably affect uh, the EV adoption rate. Uh, and uh, it's really the economics that really is the key issue out here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to worry also about the fact that if you do build all, the, all this infrastructure and EVs are slow, then how do you afford this? You know, we do, uh, I was part of a, a National Academies Committee on the Future of Electric Power in the U.S. And one of the findings was that, you know, the peak load of, uh, uh, for electric charging uh, is going to be potentially a problem. So let's look at that a little bit and see, you know, where that uh, that takes us. You know, we do. I think everybody on the uh, you know on the on the session today is going to be aware that there's a whole host of charging, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, rates. You know, level one, two, three. Uh, we have fleet charging, and you know, e semis are are starting to come in. So you know, there's there's charging rates that are going from you know a kilowatt and a half uh, to one and a half megawatts, uh, and uh, you know we keep kind of thinking about how to build these chargers uh, and, you know, don't really think so much about the grid. So let's take two minutes and think about what the impact of this, you know, by 2040 is going to be on the grid, okay? Uh, you know, analysis I've seen frequently, uh, you know, relates to the fact that, you know, if we just look at from an energy perspective, you know, it's not a very significant growth rate. Uh, and over, uh, you know, 20 years, this is very easily manageable. If you look at just level two charging, again, possibly with coordination, it's manageable. But if you start looking at fast charging, which I think is really critical in terms of, uh, you know, wide scale deployment, uh, we see that even if 10 million EVs, which is about 8% of the 2040 estimate, uh, is charging at 100 kilowatts, you see about a thousand, uh, you know, uh, gigawatts, you see a thousand gigawatts uh, of peak generation that is, uh, is required. Uh, and uh, you know, that is uh, equal to the total generation capacity in the US. How are we going to double our generation capacity uh, in the next uh, you know, 20 years? This becomes a very big problem. Also at the point of use, we start seeing that as you start you know, deploying DC fast charging stations on the distribution grid, uh, or we even more, I mean, we start de uh, deploying, uh, you, know, uh, you know, multiple truck charging stations, uh, we, we start seeing that uh, the, the distribution grid is going to be uh, very uh, stressed. You know, Bloomberg said it a few years back when they said that, you know, pure play uh, DC fast charging operators don't really have a, a good business model at this point in time. Uh, and this is something to uh, really be, con uh, you know, concerned about. Uh, so, Let's st step back and start seeing, you know, what is this intersection between transportation uh, and the grid? You know, if you, if you think about the, uh, you know, the automotive sector, it's private, it's freewheeling, it's extremely competitive, uh, and they're growing at whatever rate they can possibly, uh, you know, get to. 
Okay, the utility sector, on the other hand, is regulated, is extremely risk averse, has extremely long planning cycles, and, and uh, you know, hate anything happening that's outside their control. And everything that's happening today in terms of distributed energy resources, storage, uh, and EVs is happening outside of control. That's a problem. If you look at centrally controlled bulk systems, which is how we have today, we are migrating to decentralized uh, DR dominated systems. We don't know really how to control these systems uh, very well. Everybody is in their own silos, thinking that they're moving fast, but they're thinking that all the adjacency that they touch are automatically going to take care of themselves. Uh, for example, every uh, every uh, EV charging uh, you know, kind of company of uh, you know seen assumes that the grid is going to be there as a resource. You just have to plug in, and it's all done. And that's not going to be uh, how it is. As we start looking at the complexity of the system, we see some very strong interdependencies, uh, and we see a very strong need for flexible and adaptive uh, solutions. We think there's a need to think holistically about the issues, and if we don't, we're going to be inviting uh, you know trouble as we as we move forward. Let's take some examples, uh, very specific examples that uh, you know we've been working on uh, for a few years out here. Um, you know, you go and you buy a, uh, a Tesla and you plug it in uh, and your neighbor goes and buys another Tesla because he's inspired. Uh, and all of a sudden you have a problem where you have, you know, two or three EVs charging on your pole top transformer. Well, that completely changes uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the way the transformer has been designed in, uh, in terms of operation. Uh, and you could have a dramatic reduction in life from 30 plus years to three years. Okay. And, and this is something where the transformers are not even monitored by the utilities. So this is a fundamental problem in terms of how coordination between the utilities and their distribution grids uh, and all this thing needs to, uh, needs to really occur. If you start looking at the bulk system uh, and say that, okay, now we're going to have a truck stop with, a, uh, you know, 15, uh, you know, 50 trucks charging at the same time, that could be a 75 megawatt charging, uh, peak charging capacity. Uh, and and uh, you know, if you look from a utility perspective, that's a 10 plus year charging uh, a, a, a cycle uh, to be able to install transmission, substations and everything else. So that's a fundamental problem. From a business uh, model issue, this is, you know, also not very good. I, I know a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, charging people are complaining about, you know, demand charges that utilities impose. But if you look at, you know, what cost of rolling infrastructure is, uh, is you know, it, it's really based on, uh, you know, what, what the peak, uh, you know, uh, cost is. Uh, and, uh, you know, the demand charge that you have to pay uh, is, is really a very big part of the overall cost that, you to, that the uh, consumer has to, has to pay. So back to the fact that what we really need is uh, some, some holistic level thinking out here. We need business models that are looking, you know, across the spectrum. Think about it. The utilities are investing, you know, tremendously at the grid edge. They are putting in microgrids for resiliency. Uh, they are putting in, uh, you know, backup power. Uh, they are putting in storage. And all, and all of this is happening in duplication with what the electric vehicle uh, businesses, uh, you know, are doing. And therein lies an opportunity for, for doing uh, uh, something, uh, something together. So yes, I do think that a holistic approach uh, is, uh, uh, is needed. Uh, we see that the future grid, uh, you know, needs, you know, tremendous uh, capacity uh, at the grid edge. Uh, and I mentioned what some of these uh, things are. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of expenditure that's going to take place out there. If we can align the the, uh, the expenses that need to be taken out there with what we need to do on the uh, on the grid side, uh, this might be something that is really uh, really very interesting. We're starting to see, you know, that uh, uh, you know uh, charging stations are starting to be much broader. Uh, you know, then just, uh, you know, connect to the grid because you want to, you know, reduce the peak demand, you want to uh, be able to put in green electrons into the system, and, and all of these things create very complex systems that need to be really uh, integrated and operated as well. And then you, then you want to kind of look at the grid element and, and see, you know, what are the requirements from a grid perspective. So to conclude, what I would say is that I think there is a fantastic opportunity out here uh, to create tomorrow's energy infrastructure. And that tomorrow's energy infrastructure is all residing at the grid edge uh, and the issues of, uh, uh, of uh, EV charging, uh, of, uh, of DER integration, of energy storage integration, of resiliency, all come at the grid edge. Uh, and I think to be able to talk together is really very fundamental uh, to be able to uh, realize all these advantages, you know, uh, advantages. So with that, uh, you know, thanks, thanks, Chris. And I turn it over back to you so that you can take on and uh, introduce uh, Jake. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. 
Um, and just a reminder for folks, before we jump to the next panelist, uh, please do put any questions you may have in the Q&A box. Uh, it would be, uh, it's a great way for us to make sure that we have uh, the information that you need to help you do your jobs as, as advocates or, or, or business leaders um, and help you do your job better to be able to get these questions um, for the folks we've gathered here today. Um, all right, so moving along to our next speaker, Jake Carnemark, the CEO of Endeavor. Jake is the founder and CEO of Endeavor, a sustainable infrastructure company that is partnering with cloud companies, utilities, logistics, and critical facility operators to build a gigawatt scale network of zero carbon data centers, microgrids, and EV charging facilities. Jake is a seasoned entrepreneur with a long history of creating sustainable solutions for mission critical projects. He founded Skanska Mission Critical in 2001 and later founded, founded Aligned Energy, which grew rapidly into a multi-billion dollar company. In 2019, Jake founded Endeavor to develop and scale a new generation of decentralized technologies with the potential to make clean energy and water accessible to communities worldwide. Endeavor is currently creating a nationwide network of carbon neutral EV charging stations for logistics and heavy vehicles that leverages grid block energy router technology and renewable microgrids. The Endeavor team is back for the largest supply chain ever assembled to deliver edge infrastructure <laughs> on the network. So after hearing a little bit from Dr. Devon on the challenges, it sounds like uh, Jake is gonna give us a little bit of insight into some of those solutions. So uh, Jake, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris, appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to talking about how we approached uh, kind of the technology solution. We're excited to work with the Center for Distributed Energy on that. So grid block uh, that we're installing, as you mentioned, we are working on a very large logistics platform. We again work in the microgrid data center space and logistics. And the core function that Endeavor is taking on is we feel there are critical solutions that are not yet been developed in the market that are needed to solve some of these problems that Deepak uh, talked about. And one of the, the key things that, that I want to punctuate first is just the mention around that, you know, core solutions for EV charging, there's no real ROI even at pretty significant adoption of EV charging infrastructure. And this is important to companies, but it's also uh, that are in that space, but it's also important to large fleets, logistics companies that wanna deliver electrification of their fleet at a better ROI. Um, what Endeavor is doing, it's rapidly scaling these solutions in multiple areas. Um, and in the grid block space, one of the things that we looked at is that when we're delivering microgrids for utilities, when we're delivering data centers, unless you are constantly aware of what the grid needs to do in the sense of managing demand and supply on the grid, you're going to end up with a bigger problem. Uh, one of the most significant areas that are struggling this now are the airports that are rapidly adopting, which is a great thing, electrification initiatives. Um, surrounding communities around airports are adopting electrification issues and airports are critical services to communities. Uh, they need constant uh, balancing and good power quality. Um, and that's an area that we focused on with Brig Block and are scaling up in partnership with CDE. Uh, some of the key points around Grid Block and its solution and what we're trying to address is number one, charging infrastructure has to be software defined. And the reason why you have to be software defined and what we mean by software defined is you have to be able to change the output by vehicle. Uh, two things are, are key there. You want infrastructure that can charge multiple vehicles, a Tesla, a truck, a fleet. Um, you also want that infrastructure to be able to adapt uh, to be a 20 year infrastructure. We're just starting in the charging uh, scale Nobody has any idea of what you know electric trucks vehicles are going to be doing 20 years from now. And if you don't have a software defined infrastructure that can adapt to that, uh, you won't get the utilization and the return on your investment. Um, so the grid block is at its foundation software defined infrastructure. One of the other core features of the grid block is its multi ported nature. Um, in each individual grid block, you have six trays at 80 kilowatts a piece. 
they are paralleled and they can manage up to 16 ports as well as injection directly of solar um, on any of those ports. You can be bi-directional again to the software defined nature of it. You can output DC or AC. So on the same charging infrastructure, you can do level one, two, and three. And it can software, you know, switch instantaneously between level one, two, and three, go up to 500 kW per channel, and you can go up to megawatts if you run grid blocks in parallel. Um, what allows the infrastructure to do that is the some of the foundational kind of IP that was created uh, in the development of grid block, which is essentially packet slicing of power. So the grid block works in a way where it takes those multiple channels and it's switching at 18 kilohertz. And thus, when you take in an AC line or DC, you're slicing that up and then recombining those packets on the end, just like an internet router takes multiple internet traffic and combines it, you're doing the same thing with power flows. Um, some key features that that drives and enables is a grid block can be connected to a grid under stress uh, and it can at the same time mix and match energy sources. So batteries connected to it, solar connected to it, critical facilities, it performs the same function as a UPS um, from a backup st standpoint, as well as being able to integrate uh, generators as well as some new technologies that are low, lower inertial mass. Um, things like fuel cells. Um, so that is kind of the core functionality. The reason why we focused on this solution and scaling it up for our development platform that we're doing in Edge is that we want to be able to deliver fleet charging at scale at an ROI and a cost uh, that gives us the ability to deliver that at the adoption curve. So you're going to have companies out there that are one, two truck pilots, uh, they will scale up to higher utilization over time, but you wanna be able to deliver infrastructure that's gonna adapt to those changing conditions over time, as well as that is gonna be able to deliver resiliency to the facility to kind of you know punctuate the point in a specific example, an airport can use technologies like this and start at their EV, you know, charging lot for rentals, and then can expand to, you know, APUs on electric planes, and then can expand to, you know, some of their sustainability initiatives. And it literally, you know, is something that you can build from one grid block up to several hundred megawatts of infrastructure. And the more that you put in, the more that uh, you're able to increase the resiliency of, of your facility and or infrastructure. Um, to give you an example on the left, uh, that is the way microgrids are typically constructed. Uh, a lot of companies talk about, you know, let's put in charging infrastructure, let's have solar, let's have batteries connected to it. Uh, all of that infrastructure on the left is contained in one grid block. So again, it gives you, you know, plug and play infrastructure and eliminates a lot of that complexity. When you look at what that gear looks like in terms, most folks would be familiar of what you know a typical charging station would look like. You'd have your medium voltage transformer, you'd have your distribution gear, you'd have your DC charging sections. If you want to include solar and storage, you need separate inverters. And again, you know you're taking about 36 feet of gear and bringing it down to about a six foot square footprint in one grid block replaces all of the infrastructure to the left. Um, and it's not just about saving money, even though that's a key driver, it's about enabling a, a more simplified platform that is plug and play that can grow over time and that future proofs uh, the infrastructure. When we look at uh, one of the other key features, and this is just about the economics of charging, uh, the way most charging infrastructure is built today, it's built when you get into the DC fast charging infrastructure, it's built with the inverter coupled to the stall or the charging infrastructure, the dispenser, if you will, um, which is a, a solid approach 
other than it creates low utilization unless you have very, very high traffic into that parking space, you end up with relatively low utilization on that expensive inverter. Um, so we approach this purely from, you know, the economics of the business model and how could we achieve, you know, good returns for companies and investment uh, going into the charging space, electrification from governments and companies. And the solution really drives that you have the ability to drive higher utilization across the inverter. So a grid block is a centralized infrastructure that's plug and play that can support up to 16 slots at once. And therefore it can roll if you're parking rental cars or fleet trucks, it can roll through them. The software does that, or it allows for, you know, matching up of different charging profiles. Uh, as most of, as everybody knows on the call, it's interest in charging. It's not a steady state power draw. You get very high charging currents in the beginning of the cycle. And then as the batteries start to fill, they taper off. So this gives you the ability to match those charging profiles uh, across that and then add to the infrastructure as you build. Um, areas where we're uh, starting to deploy this in Europe, uh, we started there with a 400 megawatt platform. And again, as you mentioned, we're going to very large uh, scale distribution across North America. You know, a typical problem use case that logistics companies have is significant amount of cross dock facilities. They might have a pilot starting shortly. They want to expand that over time. This is again, you know, critical to be able to kind of plug and play as you go and add to that. Uh, a typical installation would start with one, and as utilization grows, uh, grows, you can start to expand, uh, you know, as you as you need it to kind of keep pace with the utilization. So that is the some, kind of some of the core technology that we are uh, driving for behind making charging models more efficient. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. And I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, really uh, appreciate that overview. Another reminder before we go to Kendall to make sure you are dropping questions in the chat. We look forward to getting to that um, right after we hear from our next speaker. So Kendall Whitehead is the Western Region Sales Lead for Heavy Vehicle Charging Solutions at ABB. Kendall has been at ABB for five years and with the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Group for the prior four. He has supported the technical rollout of major infrastructure projects ranging from public stations to test labs, as well as transit sites and for heavy duty EV fleets. Kendall has extensive field experience with a range of charging technology, as well as hardware interoperability testing. In addition, he has conducted many webinars and training sessions for technical and non-technical audiences across the public and fleet infrastructure deployment spectrum. Kendall holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Arkansas. And uh, now over to Kendall to tell us more about some of ABB solutions. Hey, Chris, thank you very much for that introduction and, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Deepak, Jake, uh, great job on the, on the presentations there. And uh, we'll just kind of jump in here. Um, really, I wanted to focus a little bit on kind of EV site design for, for multiple use cases, right? When we talk about particularly this NEVI funding and, and some of these, some of the money that's coming out in the future, how do we use that money wisely? How do we go about building sites that can charge the greatest amount of vehicles or the greatest use cases, whether that be light duty, medium duty, or, or heavy duty type uh, charging. So when we really think about how do we kind of create this, what I like to call a shared ecosystem between all sorts of different vehicles and all sorts of different use cases, well, a few things that I, that I really think are important. One, uh, first, the EVs and the EVSCs must be available, EVSC being an electric vehicle supply equipment, basically a charger, right? Uh, so EVs and EV EVSCs must be available um, in the past. You know, today, I think we're, we're seeing that not be as much of a problem as it has been in the past, um, but, uh, but still the point remains. Uh, two, convergent on industry standards. So we really need to think about how do we standardize around plug types, communication protocols, things like that, and, and in which direction are we seeing the industry go, right? Uh, and then number three is having an accommodating site design. And we'll look at a couple real life use cases around 
site designs that work, some that, that uh, work for some use cases and not for others. Um, and so we'll just kind of chat about that a little bit as well. So just talking a little bit about EVs and EVSEs, um, the, the market for electric vehicles is just booming now. It seems like every time you see a commercial uh, vehicle commercial, it's always an EV um, and not necessarily their latest uh, uh, commercial pickup truck or something along those lines. Um, back in, you know, when I started in this industry in 2018, there was not as many options out there. Uh, there were a few EVs on the road, mostly Chevy Bolts, uh, BMW i3s, uh, Nissan Leafs, right? And now you've got a plethora of options to, to choose from. And we're seeing this boom not only in light duty vehicles, but we're also seeing it in medium duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles. So the EVs are there, right? Um, and then on the charging side, right? One thing that we've 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 had to worry about is do we have enough infrastructure? And I think obviously these, this this funding that we're seeing coming down the pipeline and a lot of private investment as well, we're growing the amount of chargers that are available today. Um, but the question is, how do we create charging infrastructure that is going to serve the most vehicles? We can kind of see here when we look at um, typical light duty vehicle standards that that are charging on the market today: level two or SAE J1772. Um, then we have CCS1, which is an offshoot of J1772. And then at the bottom, we've got uh, Chatamo or Shademo, uh, as you may know it in, in other countries. Um, just a few cars, primarily Nissan, uh, some of the Japanese automakers that, that started out with Chatamo in the beginning are still there. And then, um, but to be honest, moving to CCS1. Uh, so we're almost seeing Chatamo do a little bit of a, of a fizzle out. And then you've got proprietary charging technology such as, as Tesla. So that's kind of what we see on the market today, right? So the EVs are there, EVSEs are there, and they're and they're they're coming more and more are coming. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, with that, we kind of need to think about okay, we've got almost all these cars converging. You know, we've got all these cars coming. What type of standardization are they using? Are they are they using uh, the same plug type, or are we going to have to do the iPhone and the, you know, the iPhone lightning port and the, the Android USB-C thing for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, we, we, what we're really seeing and what I think the industry is pushing for is um, CCS1 is kind of the DC fast charging standard for particularly light duty vehicles in the, in the, in the near to, to midterm future. Um, and then J, SAE J1772, obviously the, the AC portion of that CCS1 um, connector as the level two version, right? So uh, the good news is you can have one port on a vehicle that can serve both the AC and the DC side of this. It is standardized, it's been around for a very long time and probably 90% of the vehicles that we're seeing, or maybe even more than that, right, are, are using CCS1 today. And that's not only in the light duty space, but I would say on the heavy duty space, even the medium duty space, almost 100% of the vehicles that we're seeing on the market today are using uh, SAE J1772 CCS1 uh, type plugs. Um, some other standards of note besides CCS1 and, and CHAdeMO, um, we see in the industry J3105, which is for heavy duty vehicles, primarily bus and transit. Um, it, this is an automatic connection system where there's no human intervention required. It's got you know, either a mechanical arm that comes down on top of the bus. Uh, there are some other versions of that where the mechanical is on the top of the vehicle and then goes up to the infrastructure. And then we also see a plug-in socket version. So it's not really suitable for all sorts of different types of vehicles because not everyone has a flat roof or, or um, a, a very flat vehicle. For example, semi-trucks, uh, the cabs uh, don't necessarily have flat roofs, although the, the trailers do. Um, also, SAEJ2954, this is wireless charging. This is something that we're seeing uh, grow in popularity. Um, it's charging up to about 11 kilowatts right now. They're working on increasing the speeds there for those standards. Uh, some issues, vehicle integration is not ubiquitous, so you're not going to see a lot of vehicles today that come off of the lot that are going to work with J2954. Um, and, and then the other issue is that high power charging just doesn't fall under J2954. So uh, if we want something that's very high power, it's going to be able to charge vehicles very quickly. Wireless charging today, um, at least with J2954, there are some other standards for high power charging, but again, they're separate standards. It's not kind of all one one sort of a thing. It's similar to J1772. So uh, that's wireless charging. And then uh, obviously the big ticket name on the market right now is megawatt charging standard MCS. This is J3271. Uh, this is greater than one megawatt charging one vehicle at a time. You can tell the plug type is different. 
Um, it works very similar to J1772, but a little bit of a different plug type. Uh, this is in development. It's not really ready commercially in the market yet, although you've probably seen a lot of news recently if you followed EVS35 and Oslo. A lot of, a lot of buzz around um, the MCS connector. And really what we're going to see is almost entirely for heavy-duty applications, whether that be e-semis. I know Deepak mentioned like one, one and a half megawatts uh, for e-semis. Um, boats, tugboats, um, electric boats, mining equipment, uh, some electric airplanes, things like that. So MCS is, is really more on a really heavy duty charging for very, very heavy duty or large battery um, applications. Uh, and then we've talked about site design considerations. Um, when we're talking about trying to make something that's a shareable between everybody, I always start with, listen, let's talk about what is it gonna look like at the site? And I always say to, to start with, you know, considering islands, uh, a lot of what you'll, if you, if you drive an EV, if you're familiar with EVs, a lot of the infrastructure that we see on the market today is front-end parking versus versus islands. Usually it's a space thing, and it's usually because EVs are an afterthought. <laughs> it is, hey, we've built this parking lot. We've got a few spaces over here that we can use for parking still, but we could also use to to fill up, uh, fill up an, an EV. Uh, they'll just pull in, they'll park, and they'll be there for a few hours, right? Uh, level two charging, for example, not necessarily fast charging. When we're talking about fast charging. Islands make a lot more sense. And uh, part of the reason why uh, is because all these cars have different locations for their charge port. And there's not a standardized location for a charge port. Um, it may be on the left side, it may be on the right side, maybe in the front of the vehicle, maybe in the back of the vehicle. And so having islands, kind of you can see an example of this on the left, having islands makes it a lot easier for the cables to reach many different um, plug locations, as opposed to if you have front-end parking, uh, you may only be able to reach, you know, um, a, a few different locations. And to be honest, with high power charging, liquid cooled charging, for example, cable lengths are a little shorter than they probably um, uh, makes really, really great use of, of front end parking. Um, another thing to consider is obviously ADA. Um, so if we talk about front end parking um, versus island parking, is it, as, is it as accessible for those with disability or wheelchair access? Here, uh, another good thing about islands is that islands are a little bit more accessible for all types of vehicles, right? Whether that be a, a light duty passenger vehicle that you're you know, carrying your kids to school in, or whether that be an electric school bus that your school is carrying your kids to school in, um, or class six box truck or a class eight um, semi. So having islands and pull throughs makes it a lot easier for all sorts of vehicles to get in there. Um, I've talked with some, some heavy duty trucking friends uh, at, at some of these these companies and, and they'll try to drive these things around and they're wondering, well, where can I charge this vehicle? Well, you can go to a Walmart and you can pull into an Electrify America station, but you're gonna have to park in such a funky way. You're gonna make everybody mad because there's not gonna be any spots left because you're gonna go sideways across all of the chargers. Um, having pull through islands makes it so that, hey, we can get you know tractor trailer trucks in here. Uh, we can get school buses in if we need, but we're talking about needing a lot of infrastructure. So having something that is, uh, having something that is, that is usable by everybody um, is, is uh, gonna, gonna help us out going down the road for all use cases. And um, then just another photo here of, of some issues on the left, you can see here's a driver that had to kind of back in sideways to be able to plug into the charger uh, like they want to versus just being able to pull head in like you're supposed to on this street. Um, this, is a, this is a street where you're, it's, it's curbside parking. So you drive down the road and you pull right into an angled parking spot this guy had to back in backwards, uh, park, his, park his car over, over two different spots just so that he could charge his vehicle. Where on the, on the right side, you can see this is more of an island style parking, still had to back in, but it made it a lot easier for them to plug their vehicle into, uh, into the charger. Um, the charging infrastructure itself, uh, we're, we're a charger OEM, right? We, ABB builds and manufactures and sells these chargers. So, um, a couple of considerations about what makes sense going forward for the, the most amount of use cases, getting the most amount of people in and being able to charge. Um, we talk about high power levels. So something that's 150 kilowatts or, or higher so that you can have all sorts of different vehicles come in there and get a decent charge in a decent amount of time. Um, we also talk about a wide voltage range. So that's 150 to 920 volts. I say a thousand volts. 
Um, this is because we kind of have two segments of, of vehicles, 400 volt vehicles and 800 volt vehicles. Um, and those 400 volt vehicles are kind of uh, what we've been seeing for years, but we're starting to see more 800 volt vehicles and charging infrastructure that wasn't built with the wide voltage range are obsolete to some of these 800 volt vehicles, for example, heavy duty trucks or transit buses. Um, and so having deploying infrastructure that has a wide voltage range means that you can accept a much larger amount, uh, a lo much larger number of vehicles or, or vehicles from different vehicle OEMs. And then we talk about standardized connection methods, right? We talked about uh, CCS1 as kind of being the prevailing standard in the market today. And so I won't uh, spend too much time on that, uh, on that item. And then finally, you know, if you're going to be putting inf infrastructure out there for the public to use, whether that be um, public fleets uh, or, you know, private fleets that are using public roads or public infrastructure, um, being able to pay in, in whatever way makes the most sense to you is very important as well. So when we talk about robust authorization methods, we want to deploy infrastructure that's got all sorts of different, different ways to pay, right? Whether that be a mobile app, um, auto charge or plug and charge. This is where you plug your vehicle in, it gathers the data from your vehicle and then sends that over to the, to the charger without you having to present any form of payment, just kind of an automatic, hey, here it is type of a thing. Uh, credit card readers or a kiosk so that anybody can go up and, and charge. We're seeing that today in California with uh, NIST 44 handbook where every charger that's out on the market has to have a credit card reader installed. This is an, an, an equity thing, making sure that folks that don't have mobile apps or, or, or don't have different ways to, to pay can still use a, a, a card and, uh, and pay for their electrons. And then obviously there's a, there's a new, um, new method that's coming out that uh, we're seeing more and more of the infamous QR code, right? I think we saw a, a large increase in QR codes over the pandemic. And we're seeing some really interesting ways for people to just slap a QR code on the side of a charger and uh, make it a really cheap way to be able to pay and authorize for, for charge sessions over your, over your phone. Instead of having an app per se, or having to download a million apps, you just uh, scan a QR code and then, and then pay that way. Uh, so that's really it. There's a, this is a very broad topic. I could sit and talk for it for hours, um, but I will leave it there and send it over to the team for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kendall. I appreciate uh, you walking us through your presentation. And for the Q&A portion of our webinar, I am uh, excited to turn it over to my colleague, Rebecca Saraboff, for her Electrification Coalition debut. Uh, my new colleague, Rebecca, is an EV infrastructure associate for the Electrification Coalition. At the EC, she works on building relationships and shared expertise to accelerate federal electric vehicle charge and deployment. Before joining the EC, Rebecca supported and advanced strategic priorities at the U.S. EPA's Office of Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs, and she holds a bachelor's degree in political science and citizenship and civic engagement from Syracuse University, where she worked with university stakeholders to develop a robust and accessible campus charging network. So uh, continue, folks, to put your questions in the chat box. We'll keep monitoring that as we go forward. I know we've got some good ones queued up. So Rebecca, turn it over to you to take it away. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you to all of our panelists. It was really wonderful to learn from all of you. And I think we'll go ahead and just kick it right off with the first question that I'm going to ask to all of you to understand sort of your, your varying perspectives is what role do utilities have for these types of solutions? And what is the biggest barrier to their involvement? I can start off if that, if you like, um, Jacob here. Um, their role is, is very significant. And, and the reason for that, if you look out ahead on the charging landscape, again, as Deepak has, has mentioned, if you just take an 8% charging utilization across an all electric fleet, you end up with the capacity of the current grid. So we are gonna need a more robust coordinated infrastructure, which only the utilities can participate in. Um, and if we don't uh, coordinate with utilities and provide electrification infrastructure for charging, that is really potential to be a grid resource, we are going to end up with a less reliable grid. And what the utilities will be required to do is invest significantly in things like peaking plants to be in locations of logistics areas where there's high density of charging. And we're going to end up 
actually, you know, increasing the CO2 issue that we're all trying to solve with electrification. Um, so there's a massive opportunity for the utilities to coordinate um, strategically with charging infrastructure in such a way that we end up with a better grid at, at the end of that process. So I, I agree with uh, with what Jake said. I think the utilities are a really important partner in uh, in this whole process. Um, the the challenge I see is that the pace at which the EV industry is growing and wants to grow uh, is very difficult for the utility sector to grow at the same pace. So really, that conversation needs to be deep and needs to happen now, uh, and uh, you know, be, become part of the really the integrated resource planning that they're doing, so that uh, uh, you know, there's there's clarity in terms of you know where new substations have to go, where a new uh, you know peak loads are gonna be managed. Does that need to be from storage? Who provides that? That discussion needs to happen. Uh, and uh, otherwise this becomes very challenging. Yeah, and just, just uh, I'll kind of reiterate what Deepak said is, is whenever we're talking with fleets, whenever we're talking with somebody who's trying to deploy EV charging infrastructure, uh, particularly at, at scale, um, it's always starts with, hey, are you chatting with your utility? Are you talking with your utility? Um, the good thing about ABB is we've got a lot of utility customers and so we can help kind of uh, clue you into, hey, here's the, here's the person you need to be talking to at this utility. If you don't talk to your utility option or you don't have that uh, sort of relationship, we can help develop that. Um, but it's it's absolutely as early as you can, chat with the utility, let them know of your plans, try to get that resource planning put in place so that when you do need that energy or when you need to get a transformer upgrade, it's not a surprise to the utility. Um, it's not a you know two, three, four year process. It might still be quite a, quite a bit of a process. Um, so the earlier that you can get that done, uh, or get that started, the, the better. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know Chris and I talk a lot about relationship building, so it's definitely nice to hear you all reflect that as well. Um, the next question that we have from the audience is specifically geared towards Jake and Kendall. We've heard that there are some current challenges with the supply chain for electricity infrastructure. Are there current or near-term supply chain issues that you're tracking, and do you do any of your solutions help to alleviate those concerns? Or you want me to? You want to go first, Kendall, or you want me to dive? Go, go ahead, Jake. I, I think that I think that uh, your you know seeing your your slide, you may have a pretty good answer for this. So, two things are are. Overall, what you want to create is, you know, simplicity across the supply chain. So when you look at complex, large EV infrastructure, you know, the more you can simplify the infrastructure so that there's less reliance on key components. You don't want a situation where the complexity of the infrastructure, the number of parts, you're missing one, and then you can't move forward. So that is just a key high-level concept um, specifically on the supply chain, we definitely are seeing longer lead times on a lot of the critical components. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are being addressed. They really are a function of, of, you know, kind of some of the recent events in the last two years. There's massive builds happening on in the semiconductor market. Um, so I think those will be addressed long term, but there's no question that there's in the next couple of years, we're going to have constraints and it's really a matter of planning for them, uh, you know, investing in the capital to make sure that you can deliver. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I concur with that. I think it's it's interesting, right? Um, we talk about whether the solutions will or will not alleviate some of those concerns. Um, being able to, to provide or package in a transformer or switch gear or something like that into kind of a, an integrated solution or a package solution is a is an idea on can we do that? Uh, but you still need to get transformers, you still need to get switchboards, you, know, you need to find some of that critical power equipment and, and procure it, which um, you know is, is just like Jake mentioned, it, it, it's taken a little bit of longer, longer time uh, than what we've seen in the past. So uh, I think planning is, is important. Um, you know, I think, I think when it comes down to it, uh, we're seeing that if you're, if you're planning a, an EV charger, project um your transform if, if you need a transformer upgrade that's probably your your biggest problem point and that is, is going to be hey i need to get a new transformer i need to get the permit i need to talk to my utility i need to get that taken care of and then i need to get the the, the transformer and put it in place that may be at this point in time a two or a three-year process 
Um, I mean, quite a quite a long time, um, 150 weeks lead time, right? Uh, which can which can just blow people's brains off at this point in time. Um, so a lot of the if you can fit everything else underneath that, then then you can you know. But it's like getting there early and thinking about it and planning for I'm going to need to spend three years to get this massive transformer upgrade. So let me make sure that my EV chargers are going to show up in time. My switchboards are going to show up in time. Let me make sure my vehicles are not going to be delayed because on the vehicle side, there's also these similar issues. So again, we kind of think about it as an, as an ecosystem and kind of how everything works together instead of just, hey, we're relying on one particular thing or, or I've only got to worry about this little piece of it, right? It's a, it's this whole thing that we've got to try to think about and try to get everybody, everybody there and kind of at the same time all together. So uh, may not have answered the question quite directly, but we are, you know, we're obviously seeing some impacts from there. I think that, that planning is probably the best way to prevent that. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know that a number of us on this webinar have spent a bunch of time reading the 180 day standards that just came out um, and a, a topic that's addressed in those um, that's been of a special interest to me is talking about standards and requirements to cope with increased flooding and determining where to locate stations for resilience um, and how to reduce impacts from severe weather events. Kendall, I'm going to first turn this question to you. Yeah, so that's that's actually very pertinent. I think um, with, with almost everything that you've put in the ground these days, it seems like, um, you know, I just watched a bridge get ripped away by a river in Yellowstone, right? And um, kind of some, some what, what happens when that happens in the middle of town where you've got uh, large power infrastructure everywhere um, and, and live electrical lines. I think one, um, from a safety perspective, right? Uh, there's, there's a lot of different things and, and ele power electrical systems have tons and tons and tons of, of, of safety equipment to try to prevent issues from occurring. Um, but um, how can you build your site to be more resilient so that things like that don't happen? Um, I think, I think, uh, in, in certain areas, obviously we're seeing folks lift electric chargers up, up off of the ground, um, entirely put, putting them, uh, on gantries or on, uh, electrical rooms that are on the roof of buildings, um, things like that. Um, we're seeing folks do, for example, solar canopies, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? Especially if you have crazy sun, um, temperature can be a problem for, for electric vehicle chargers. Um, their electrical systems, they produce heat and then just adding external heat to the system is always, is always an issue as well. So planning and putting canopies uh, at your site is also a, a really good, good way to kind of, one, make it, make it a better customer experience so they're not waiting out on the hot sun forever. But um, you can also do some grid resiliency by adding solar to the system or, or some, some different things as well as sun protection and different weather protection as well. So um, I think that's a, that's a very broad question. We can go in a hundred different directions, but um, I think there's a lot of ways people are, people are kind of, you know, blocking and tackling when it comes to uh, building resiliency in their site for both weather and just adverse adverse effects. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question that we have that I'll ask to all of you is we have a question from someone in the chat who's curious for your thoughts about the role of battery buffered EV charging. Is this something that any of you all are looking at, something that piques your interest? Yeah, this is Jacob. I, I can start off. Um, it's it's absolutely critical uh, and, and surprising that is not as many, you know, charging infrastructure companies are focused on as, as that is a core feature. Uh, we feel that it's that it's an absolute requirement. Um, and the reason for that, again, if you don't have battery infrastructure kind of plug and play capable and EV charging, you're going to have issues in demand charges. And then as we start to, you know, a drop, adopt and scale EV infrastructure, you know, the grid will not be able to effectively support it without capacitive infrastructure in place. Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's a core requirement um, around making sure that you have the ability to, you know, rapidly add or put in place uh, battery infrastructure to support, to support it. Maybe I can add a, a couple of sentences to that. Uh, I think I agree with, uh, with Jake. Um, I want to also kind of provide the grid perspective uh, on this. 
Um, as we start seeing more uh, EV fast charging applications coming in, you're going to see, uh, you know, very high demand charge and, and stress on the grid itself. So the, for the grid to manage that as well as DERs, you know, there's the need for storage. But the storage comes from from the EV station or from somewhere else, you know, is 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 you know open to to uh, to debate and is part of the commercial question. But there is storage required out there if you really want to optimize the system. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think I think the way you, you said it was was great, and, and kind of where this question is coming from, right? Is is are there battery integrated chargers, right, or are there battery integrated um, resilient grid systems that the chargers are installed into? And so, um, you know, I, I know uh, early on, ABB actually had a has a, an investment in in FreeWire. Um, we've been a, we've been kind of following that technology for a really long time, and we've also got microgrid storage groups within ABB to kind of Hey, if we want to put a put a microgrid together where we say, here's the chargers, here's your switch gear, here's your transformers, here's your battery, and your storage, your solar PV, everything, put all that together into a microgrid. I think the idea is, yes, we want battery battery integrated systems or battery buffered charging systems, but we may not see them on the charger itself. One, because that means if you've got it on the charger itself, you've got a much larger charger out near the vehicles. And that can make it make it difficult from a site design perspective. But if you can take that battery energy storage system and place it on an electrical pad where your maybe your switch gear, your transformer is your pad mount transformer, and get that away from a lot of the infrastructure where people are driving every day. And so I think we'll see a lot of grid resilience systems where um, we're having battery energy storage that is separated away from the actual plug-in point, but built into the microgrid that's there at the site. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we are going to ask the last question here. Um, Kendall, I'll start with you, and I'm curious to hear from everyone here. Do you envision uniform site design for charging stations from different EVSC providers? And if so, how do you think that that can be accomplished? So this is a, this is a very interesting question because I love innovation and I want to see like the different things that people come up with but from a user perspective I mean think about when you you know if you if, if you've been driving for the last 20 years you've been going to a gas station and your experience at each gas station is just about the same right whether it's Chevron or Shell or Exxon or whoever um, you're you're pulling into an island style lot that's got a large canopy over the top with lights so you can see uh, there's pumps on both sides and you probably got them in a row and you maybe you got two rows or more. Um, the experience is very, very, very similar across everybody. And I think that um, at once we kind of get to a mass adoption perspective, we're going to see a lot of convergence in that in that area that's that's very similar. Um, but I think with EV charging, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Right. And to be honest, a lot of people are just going to be charging at their house. Um, so we won't see as much. I don't think we're going to see as many vehicles or as much turnover that we see today. So maybe there's a way to kind of get creative and change the way that that uh, we'll, we'll see that. But I do think that at some point in mass adoption, and this is a this is a me uh, of me opinion, but I think we'll start to see some conversion just just from a customer experience perspective. People are more more familiar with uh, with that type of a, that, that type of an environment. I'd like to present a slightly different perspective. Um, Yes, I mean, you know, at, at one level, yes, uh, you know, you will charge your car at home if you have a garage and, and charging available. That leaves 55% of the PUS people out because they don't have a garage or they live in apartments. And, 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 and that's, that's problem number one, I think. The second thing is, I'm not sure it's exactly right to equate uh, a charging or a, a, a refueling experience for a gas car where you spend two minutes at the, uh, at the place with something where you're spending 25 minutes at the place. Uh, and uh, if you, you know, translate that to two minutes at the place, you're now charging at five megawatts in a car, and there's no way we're gonna do that and, and manage everything else at the same time. So my, my suspicion is that this is going to be a slightly different uh, experience. Uh, and uh, we'll see an evolution of, I mean, I am particularly intrigued by Audi's, uh, you know, Sky Club or whatever uh, fancy term that they're coming out with. You know, where you get the charging done, you get your massage, you get everything else. You know, that's one example of it. But I'm just saying that I think you're going to see, uh, because of the time that you're spent, you'll see different examples emerging, I think. Yeah, yeah just I, to just, build or go ahead. Kendall. Sorry, I was, I was going to say, yeah, just to clarify, my my point is not that I think it's going to be equivalent to what we see at, uh, at, at stations today. 
I think there's going to be a different experience, but I do think that providers will converge on that similar experience. So I think we, we probably agree, Deepak. And to kind of add, we, we talked about kind of the, the customer or the, or the, you know, the residential experience or for a residential customer. The other thing that I think is, is going to definitely uh, grow is in large fleets, right? And that's going to be based purely on kind of charge through, you know, economics. In other words, how do you best set up charging so that it can be done while trucks are being loaded and unloaded across dock facilities? If you look at rental agencies, they're going to need you know, charging infrastructure as cars come in, get clean, turned over, checked out um, for, you know, the, to support the economic model for rentals. So there's going to be uh, a lot of thought needed to be given in kind of flexible solutions that exist to kind of support what really becomes a business model. I mean, the, the of charging, if you look at, you know, trucks today, the, the old math used to be, you know, 59 cents per mile but that was at three dollar and fifty cent a gallon diesel for uh, a diesel truck. Now it's double that. And if you look at you know charging electricity prices, obviously have not had the same volatility. And you're about one quarter the cost for large you know for a large vehicle from running on you know electrons. So the drivers to accelerate this, it's it's a, it's green is, is really one of the small drivers when you think about it the economic driver to move to electrification of fleet especially when you get into logistics is is very 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 significant so wonderful thank you so much um for all of your insight and your willingness to answer our questions i know that we really appreciate the hour that we have spent together and i am going to bump it back to chris to close us out thank you to our audience and thank you to uh, uh our, our panelists especially um, our Electrification Coalition Business Council members, ABB and Endeavor, for joining us. A reminder for the audience, two things. One, we are hiring, so please check out our website and spread the word. And two, uh, join us next month, third Thursdays at 2 o'clock is the uh, time and date for this regular charging infrastructure webinar series. Next month, we'll be on the new standards and requirements from the federal government for the Nevi uh, station. So join us then. We will look forward to seeing you there. And thanks again.